We've all seen the AT form factor. We've all seen the various flavours of the ATX form factor too, and probably even encountered a far few LPX boards over the years. But unless you whack in some specific areas, you might never have encountered PC-104. Until now. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and if you hadn't gathered, today we're going to look at a little PC-104 system. Don't really have anything else to say on the intro, so we'll just get on with it. Some people might consider this to be a small 486. Well, I can go smaller. A lot smaller. Damn, I never thought I'd say that. I don't feel the need to compensate for anything, but, well, I can't speak for everybody else. Obviously this is a PC-104 motherboard. It's a tiny form factor with a few variants, though they're fairly sensible. All you really need to know about that is there are multiple sizes, namely plain PC-104 like we have here, Epic and EBX. The latter two are slightly larger, but they do seem to allow for the use of PC-104 peripherals. Overall, it's probably interchangeable either way, so long as your casing provides for it. Otherwise, there are different buses, just like a regular PC. In our case, this is a plain old PC-104, because it only has a regular 16-bit PC-104 bus. This is a parallel bus using IDC-like board-to-board -board interconnectors, and being parallel means you can stack the things up in just about any order, though, naturally, this does have limitations in regards to the available power and resources as well as cooling the stack of devices properly, so if you were to build such a system, the stacking order is obviously something you have to consider in advance. So, what is the PC-104 bus, and why don't you really see it anywhere else? Well, you do. It's that same old trusty ISA bus from your regular PC, but with a different connector. We've certainly seen this done before on laptops, but, well, yeah, they do it on PC-104 boards. You can even get adapters to use ISA cards with it, and I would imagine you can likely do it the other way around as well. But these things are quite expensive, to the point it may even be cheaper to just make your own PCB. Design it, send it off to be fabricated as a one-off, and... Yeah, you probably wouldn't actually make a loss doing that versus buying one. It's kind of ridiculous in this sector. Some of the oldest PC-104 boards only had 8-bit ISA, and those would lack this second shorter connector. Otherwise, it's the same pinout. Again, the principle is very much the same as a regular PC motherboard's ISA slots in this regard. More sophisticated boards might offer PC-104+, which would consist of another set of board interconnects at the opposite edge of the PCB. If you hadn't guessed by now, PC-104 Plus would be PCI. Oddly, the system we have here would be entirely capable of doing this, so I'm not quite sure why they didn't implement it. The, the hardware on the board can certainly provide a PCI bus, and it does actually have one. There's just no connector for it, for whatever reason. It's possible that this one was designed to replace older boards if they failed, or maybe it was just to cut costs. I don't really know. But beyond that, the ISA bus on these 104 boards was eventually replaced with PCIe, using a far denser connector type. The, there still seem to be a lot of boards with ISA in use out there. If you still haven't worked it out, this is the entire system, just about. This one PCB contains everything you need to run the computer, aside from a power supply. Something you have to plug in using a standard bug connector, like 3.5 inch floppy drives normally use. We've got onboard IDE, floppy, VGA, an LCD controller, fast Ethernet, four serial ports, two USB ports, one parallel port, two PS2 ports, 32 megs of SD RAM, it's going to be shared up to four megs with the graphics card, and an SSD of the same size, known as a disk on chip or DOC. Under the heatsink is an old friend, the STPC Atlas, uh, SOC system on a chip that was quite popular where it was relevant, and flew the flag for the 486 architecture long after most people had left it behind, 
We did talk about this in another video already, so you can always watch that one if you want to know more about the world of industrial computers, SPCs, SOCs and STPCs, because I won't repeat too much of it in this one. Needless to say, this system is an SPC, a single board computer. The STPC SOC on this one runs at double the speed of the other one we looked at at 133 MHz here, which is certainly among the fastest 486 cores you can find. One thing I will repeat from the other video is that the STPC uses a Cyrix 486 core, which is logical as ST were one of the companies contracted to fabricate the Cyrix designs in prior years. I guess it made sense to use the existing license. What we have here is effectively a Cyrix 486 DX2, as it runs on a 66 MHz bus with a 2 times multiplier, which as we mentioned with the other one is quite interesting in its own right, as, well, 486s didn't really go up to this speed, at least not officially, some boards can do it with undocumented jumpers, and a part of me does wonder if it was perhaps planned for socket 6, but, well, we don't know, and they use the same clock generators as Pentium boards, so why they can do it is likely just a vestigial feature of that. These ones seem to have an internal clock generator, so, well, we really don't have to think about that kind of thing here. Now, this particular STPC seems to have been made in 2006, but the board itself could have been assembled significantly later by Arbor Technologies. It's not exactly a brand you really hear of, but, well, they do exist. There are honestly quite a few names you never hear of outside of the industrial and PC-104 world, and... This is certainly one of them, but I don't really know if they're one of the better ones, or if they're popular or what. All I know is that they exist. Now, peripherals. You can obviously plug in regular hard drives or optical drives, floppy drives too if you want those. The IDE ribbon has connectors for both desktop and laptop drives, and the board can map drives above the 137GB limit without issue. You can forget about that today, though, because we'll be using this one to boot the system, the M-Systems discon chip. M-Systems? M-People? Oh god, no, I fucking hate that song. My headmistress used to play it whenever she got angry and sing to it. It was just maddening. Now, this is a little discon chip at only 32 megabytes. Internally, they use blocks of flash memory, not unlike a modern SSD, really but they fit into a dip socket, and obviously don't have quite the level of resilience that you would expect today's drives to have. However, this isn't usually a problem, as write cycles should be quite low, which is just as well, because writing to it can actually be quite slow on occasion. You're not even guaranteed that many writes to a given block before things wear out and start being a little patchy. But where these would have been used, you'd basically start the OS and run whatever program from this without ever really having to write anything to it that much. In a kiosk, it's just going to run the same boring sequence of events all day, and in a factory, any writes to the system would probably be made via another system and then read in from external media, maybe USB or a CD, a floppy disk, or you might have even used Ethernet to do it. In such use cases, these M-Discs should almost never fail. As they run really cold, they don't have any moving parts, and they can withstand extremely harsh conditions where mechanical drives would almost certainly fail. Beneath the motherboard module, with all of this on board, is our next peripheral, an audio card. Yeah, you can get those, but good god don't look at the prices if you have a weak heart. The same goes for anything else, really. You can buy literally any peripheral in this form factor, quite possibly more than you can in regular card forms that go in the PC, and I do really mean anything. Four-channel video capture cards for CCTV, VGA cards, protocol analyzers, belt controllers, CNC controllers... Really, the possibilities are limitless if you've got the money. It will be out there somewhere. I'll just stick with my sound card. Unfortunately, this VGA card doesn't work with my STPC for some reason. It might be dead as the previous owner apparently had no luck with it either. It's not a big deal, it's nice to have at least, I don't really see these that often. They might notice that on the silk screen, this sound card says it was made by Diamond and has the name Crystal on it, but, well, it's neither the Diamond or Crystal that you're familiar with. 
and it uses an ESS chip. Given that the ES1869 is just a regular ISI audio solution, you can really imagine how easy it was for them to interface this to the PC104 bus there. There's no silly business required to get that to work whatsoever. It does have a connection for a game or MIDI port, just like a regular sound card, but also has a connector for front panel jacks. Now if you're wondering why I don't have a case for this system, those are really expensive too, more than I'm really willing to pay. Perhaps someday I'll make one myself, but for now we can demonstrate without one. I mean, we'd only have had to take it out of the case anyway. Those things are quite cramped. Obviously I don't have a factory to run, or a kiosk to advertise shit people don't need with. So, can we use it as a regular DOS system? Well, of course we can. The disk on chip is quite responsive, probably better than the supported Ethernet boot anyway. So, going into DOS is fairly quick, aside from the memory test, and getting to Windows isn't too hard either. Simple, easy, no bullshit. Can we run some games on it maybe? Yes and no. Keen has problems with memory detection, but then I have the same issue with my Pentium and one of my 486 machines, so I don't know, maybe my copy's broken or maybe it was always broken. This is an id game after all. I think I could get around it if I fiddled with things, but I just can't be bothered anymore. I've got plenty of machines that'll run this. Duke Nukem 2 works, and the ESS Audio provides a trouble-free experience, to be honest. It doesn't use a real Yamaha FM chip or anything, though, and I think some of the components on the board could have done to have been a little better. It sounds okay, we'll have a quick listen to it. I am back. It certainly seems usable to me, there's nothing horribly wrong with it. I'm happy enough with that. But you can actually skip Duke Nukem 2 and go straight on to Duke Nukem 3D. This thing will run it. But we are now encroaching on the upper limits, and I think that a lot of this comes from the onboard UMA VGA. It's not really that fast. We discovered this with the 66 MHz model, and let's face it. Under its intended use case, it didn't really need to be that fast, it just needed to work. And it does work. The game is generally playable on it, I mean you are going to get better frame rates when you're not in demo camera mode like that. And I always feel like you probably do want a Pentium beyond this point anyway, so... Well, it's not a big deal, it goes as far as it can reasonably expect it to. I mean, sure, if we could use a PCI graphics card, it probably would perform better, but... Yeah, this is good enough, considering it's coming out of something so small. You're gonna have to make sacrifices somewhere. Overall, the experience is quite indistinguishable from any other 486 with a similar configuration. I guess we should see how fast this thing is then. I'll be pitting it against an AMD X5133 as, well, that's what I have the results for on hand. Plus, the X5 is a 486 core at the same clock speed as this one. So, it does seem like a reasonably far contest. However, the AMD does have L2 cache available to it on the motherboard, where the STPC doesn't, as well as a PCI video card. There is no doubt that the AMD system will perform faster as a result of if not the Vodge, the L2 cache, and just the fact that motherboard is probably geared a little more for performance, whereas this one is geared to reliability and reliability only. But whatever, let's take a look. AMD wins 3D Bench 54.4 versus 79.3. PCP Bench is 15.6 for this STPC versus 20.7 for the AMD. All in all, I don't think the STPC is doing too shabby here, given what it's designed for. It does take the lead in top bench as well, just barely, with 219 against 213 for the AMD. Not too bad. 
it's certainly capable. It does score 43 in speed sys CPU against 47 for the AMD. It's fairly close and they're both within the ballpark, comparable to a 66 MHz Pentium at this point. Things are similarly close with the memory bandwidth, 96 against 100. There's basically nothing in it here, which is kind of odd because the ECS board and AMD processor have to use EDU memory. And even then, I measured no advantage of uh, fast page memory. Arbor do limit the timings on this board pretty hard in places, so the SD RAM maybe can't always give you much if any advantage. There are definitely cases where the SD RAM does seem to yield operations that complete a little faster, but overall I have to wonder if they only supported it thinking it would become the cheaper solution versus aged FPD RAM or EDO RAM nobody was going to make anymore. If that is the case, you do have to wonder if buying the SD RAM chips individually was very cheap at the time, because buying modules went stupidly expensive once DDR was around and once DDR2 was around. I distinctly remember it costing almost a pound per megabyte for dusty old sticks that nobody would buy, and the shops just couldn't get rid of them. I'd imagine they all went into landfill because they just refused to lower the price for some reason. Visa speed is limited to 13 megs per second. The Verge scores 17 megs per second. I had the UMA VGA set to 4 megabytes of shared memory when running these tests. It's not terrible overall. The L1 cache is slower at 59 megs a second versus 84 on the AMD. Obviously no level 2 cache is present, so we can't measure that. Memory throughput is 33 megs a second. It's ballpark considering the AMD's measuring 38. Modifying the bias to mess with memory some more might let you go a bit faster, but I, I still think this is adequate. I'm not really that interested in doing that. I'm not going to read the test for the disk on chip, but overall it does seem quick enough. The AMD X5 isn't necessarily a bad choice in some ways, because AMD did have their own SOC on the market, the AMD ELAN. It wasn't quite as integrated as the STPC, it required more supporting chips than these usually do, but it was basically just the X5 or the DX4. It's just a 486 core. Uh, Strangely, they do say in data sheets that they release an ATX form factor board for it, or at least planning to. I've never seen one, but they do have a picture, which is kind of weird to think that there was a socketed 486 out there that was at some point at least intended to go into an ATX motherboard of sorts. That's kind of strange, but yeah, I don't know if that ever actually made it to production. I've never seen it, never heard of it in use. If you ever do find one, let me know. I don't think I'd want to pay for it and buy it, but it'd be nice to know that it exists. Doom finishes in 2200 real ticks, which is around 33 frames per second, so quite a lot of the time the game is probably going to be up on the 35 frame a second cap. The AMD can exceed this in finishing the same demo in 1574 ticks, about 47 frames a second. Quake is actually quite slow at 8.7 frames a second, but again, this is a game that wants a 5th generation system. And even then, I have had it still grind to a halt in places on 5th gen systems running at over 150 megahertz. You'd never really play it on here, that's for certain, and it is known to run badly on Cyrix chips already. The AMD can get 14.5 frames a second, though, again, in many places, the game is going to just chunk really badly on either system, so I'm not that concerned. It's Unfortunately, by now, Cyrix's floating point units weren't really as quick as they were once known to be. They did fall behind in this regard a little as the years went on. But there we go. There it is. A fairly usable machine, and one that could certainly be improved by connecting up that MIDI port, as well as building a case for everything to live in. But there's the question. Would I recommend building this kind of thing? Uh, absolutely not. Not unless you can get it for free. The cost of this hardware is, like most industrial hardware, utterly retarded. So unless you get lucky, it's pretty much a fool's game for now. Although with scalpers ever increasing prices for the regular hardware, 
probably won't be that long before this stuff actually works out cheaper. Maybe it is worth keeping an eye on. But probably not. I mean, how long is this stuff going to last? And the scalpers for this are only going to put the prices up more at that point, I don't doubt. It's certainly ridiculous. Nonetheless, now you've seen something that's a little less usual, and that's always good in my opinion. I mean, you just have to test these things really, don't you? It goes without saying. So there we go, that's basically all there is to it. There are things I didn't mention, mostly I said them in the other STPC video, so if you weren't around when I did that you can always go and catch up on that if you want to, or don't, it's not a big deal. The, yeah, I, I quite like this thing, it's kind of neat, I should make a case for it someday. I almost wonder, because it doesn't require any high voltage and high power if you could just stick it in a briefcase or something with an LCD screen make your own portable the peripherals for it would be ridiculously expensive but I suppose it wouldn't be that infeasible that you could hang a ribbon cable off of the PC104 bus connectors and just hook it to an ISA riser and just stick it on a, a passive ISA backplane stick that in there, probably work, I don't think you'd really require any components in the middle, maybe a couple of capacitors here and there just to, to stop noise getting in, but I don't think it'd be complicated, I probably won't ever do this because I, I don't think I'd need any other peripherals adding on, the system works as it is and I, I do like the small form factor of it, so I don't know what we'll do with it, but we'll do something at some point. It comes out every once in a while to play. Like I say, it's, it's a novel thing. It's quite fun. But do I recommend having one of these? Only if you can get it for free. Because they're really, really expensive. I was lucky on this one. It cost me a bit less than they usually do. That sound card, that took a lot of hunting down. It was the cheapest one I could find. And it was into three figures. It was... Uh, yeah, I had to really, really kind of turn off my better judgement to actually pay for that, but I wanted to mess with it. And it's been long enough now that I just kind of forget about how much that bothered me. It's still kind of shit. Obviously my workstation's still a bit of a mess. I have been looking at what I'm going to replace it with. Time's kind of running out. I, I am trying to be far and leave it a bit longer, because... I do like the look of the, the Ryzen processors that are out there, they seem really capable, but I'm still, I just can't find motherboards that really do what I want. To be honest, it's weird how only board makers I don't really feel comfortable paying that much money to seem to make them. A lot of them seem to be micro ATX, or they seem to be a micro ATX feature-wise board stuck on a full ATX size PCB and they're, they're just missing things that I need to do and they're really expensive I, I don't like that because you know one of the reasons I, I used to like AMD one of the things I liked about them was that they were cheaper than Intel almost invariably and at some point that has changed and when I look things up it will cost me more to build an AMD machine and so really I know it's not going to change within the next week or so. I'm still holding out, but no new stuff's just going to magically appear. So, odds are we're going to be moving to a Xeon W2200 series, I think it was. And I'm kind of looking at the Supermicro X11 SRA motherboard. It'll be nice trying to max the RAM out on that. That's not going to be cheap. I think we'll have to do that in increments. But from what I've seen, those... It, that looks like it'll do what I want, and to get those kind of features on AMD, I'd, I'd have to start buying into Epic and things. They're really expensive, and I know they're faster, but I just I don't have that kind of money. There's just no middle ground, and it's unfortunate I sort of fall between the cracks, and I don't really want to use Intel again, but that's looking like where we're going to be. So I don't know when that's going to be, a few months from now, so we're going to be stuck with this thing for a while. I, I don't have money to just throw out the problem, unfortunately. So we'll just do what we can in the meantime. It's, uh, I can get things done, it's just slow. And when I'm not dealing with that, I do have other problems. My rats are getting old now, I've got two of them are basically dying on me, so you know I have to 
mess around looking after them. I have to soggy their food for them. One of them I have to keep feeding by hand because she's really weak. It's If it's not that, it's just other shit getting in the way. There's a lot of stupid, boring IRL things that always seem to be going on now. I think it's just part of getting older, you know. You, you become an adult and you have all these responsibilities and it, they just get worse as time goes on. You know, oh well, maybe I finally put that behind me and then ten more things show up and it's just never fucking ending. I, people who have children, I don't know how the fuck they do it because I, I imagine that must be a lot worse. But then maybe the kid screaming at you all the time distracts you from it and you can kind of, I don't know. It's not something I've done, so... Uh, not my problem. But whatever. I, I don't really have anything to say. Uh, I just, yeah, I'll, I want to get a Casio CZ1 demo up at some point. It might be on its own, I'll just upload it whenever. I have a new machine coming. We might look at it at some point, but you'll probably see it in the background of some other video beforehand where it's going to be used. Don't know when that'll be, but it's something I definitely want to do. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm out of shit to say. So, as always, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching, and I will see you again next time around. And remember, don't be a screw up, load DOS 622. You know, I'll be honest, I am looking forward to the uh, the amount of irritation it causes to people somewhere that are like, yeah, fuck Ryzen, I'm going to Intel. You know, even though I explicitly stated reasoning and that I would like to be using Ryzen, somebody's going to tell me I'm wrong and completely ignore the, the reasons and the, the facts that they stated that it just doesn't fit my use case. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that because people get quite rabid about their favourite brand names. So just, you know, remember, consume product, get excited for more product or whatever, I guess are the, those are the types, right? I mean, <laughs> they, they just seem to be driven by brand names. The great thing about not being a fanboy is you can basically just buy the best stuff for the job you want it to do at any given time. So, it's just something to consider. Maybe just think about that. I'm sure most sane people with any ounce of logic think that way already, but I just wanted to, to stick it on the end here just for the hell of it. But uh, as I said, I'll see you around.